There's this concept that I wrote in my book, Iron Triangle. When you have product, engineering, and design working united to build the solution. So that tension is important, but that's the Iron Triangle. It's strong and doesn't break, and it's important to have the tension. But now when you have the CEO playing that side of the triangle, what happens is, with time I learned, like, just zoom out. See where you're going. Like, if you don't zoom out, you're putting, like, a lot of energy to propel the boat to a direction that's not where you want to be. And having a designer, like the formation of the Iron Triangle will help you, I guarantee. If you veer off one degree in the wrong direction, down the line that's so far off whatever your original path was, just keep going down that flow. And you never have the option to reset because there's too much on stake. When you are complaining about something not working, what alternatives are you bringing to the table to fix it? What are you doing for it? Because just bringing me problems, yeah, sure, that's easy, but can you do that entrepreneurs are always looking for the quick win the quick exit the quick payday a lot of people are like oh do this and do this and then you know sell in two years i'm like that's very unrealistic they're not ready for the five ten year journey that's going to take to build a successful profitable company don't do it for an outcome do it for the journey because the journey is what you're going to be doing most of the time and you have to enjoy the journey because it, it's a long one 100 it's a long one so but thank you for coming on i really enjoyed the conversation thank you for having me Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Alberto. He started his career as an engineer in the early 2000s. You've had various engineering and architect roles at companies like IBM, Kaplan, Amplify, OnDeck. You were the head of engineering at companies like Schoololo Schoolology, PowerSchool Group, and LaunchStarter. Uh, after COVID, you authored a book called Building and Managing High Performance Distributed Teams. And most recently, you're the CTO of a company called HireVue. That sounds like me. <laughs> Welcome to the show. One thing I wanted to get started and kicked off is you've had a very long engineering career across various size companies, various size teams. What's one of the biggest differences you see as an engineering leader from having to lead a smaller, more agile team to a more larger corporate big company? What would you say is one or two key differences? Uh, well... Um, the differences is, um, it's, um, I guess the main one, the problems are, or the challenges are very similar. Okay. Uh, the difference, I always like to make analogies with uh, yeah. boating is yeah. like, it's a small boat, a way more maneuverable yeah. than a cargo ship. Yeah. Uh, they have the same principles and fundamentals, but, uh, you know, like, uh, to move like a big cargo, it takes a lot more energy even to move like one degree to right or left. Yeah. While like the smaller one, everything that you do, the impact is a lot larger. So I think like a, one of the things is um, uh, if you are trying to build like the culture of empowerment, the culture of like uh, belonging, what happens is in a larger organizations, everything takes longer. Yeah. Everything takes a little bit more time. And then what happens with the founders is, uh, or like smaller companies sometimes is uh, uh, you have the empowerment, but it's very easy as well to many times to have people just burned out yeah. uh, because you have to be wearing many hats. So I think that's one of like uh, the key differences, like in a smaller company, you, you have to wear like so many hats and be okay with it. And then in a larger organization, you you have to be uh, okay with things taking a lot longer to actually happen. Yeah. So you, the, I, I like to say patience is a virtue. So you test your patience a lot more like in a larger organization than in a smaller organization. Uh, so that's probably like a, a one key thing a second, um, probably in a smaller organization, if you are like a mission-driven person, um, join like a startup with a purpose, you probably gonna be a lot happier when compared like when you're like in a, in a, in a bigger organization. Yeah. So I'm not saying that you cannot be passionate about like a larger organization or like or the product or the purpose, um, but, it, it's a lot harder to connect 
um, with the purpose, I would say. So. Just one learning question. This is more for my interest. As a CTO, head of engineering, how hands-on are you with getting stuff done, pushing code out, versus how much more high-level and orchestration? I like to be very hands-on because yeah. uh, for me, uh, and I would explain what hands-on actually means. There's different levels yeah. of being hands-on. Yeah. But uh, that's how I earn the respect from anyone in the team, regardless of the size. Makes sense. Now being a CTO of like a hundred and seventy Engineer. engineers versus uh, you know long starter. When I started, I was the fifth uh, on the engineering team. Yeah. Um, so uh, my hands-on is a lot more on orchestrating the processes. But I write the processes uh, for, you know, how how should the, the code get from your local dev machine out the way to production? Full pipeline. The full pipeline. How how is structuring that? I'm hands on up to today's day. Okay. You know, now Alberto writing code. Well, probably not the best usage of my time. Yeah. Uh, not where I, I become like too expensive. Uh, uh, and probably not as good as like uh, many of my engineers. But you know, if we need to talk uh, about you know writing resilient code, like uh, writing scalable code, like testable code, all those practices and processes, I'm hands on in that regard. Yeah, because that is kind of like riding a bike; and yeah. it never gets old. The, yeah. the principles of uh, writing good code uh, is is the same way before AI, way before yeah. like uh, you know. Uh, one day I will uh, can talk like I start I start coding in PL one COBOL. Okay. So uh, the principles from that to like more modern language. Uh, all the same. Well, I wouldn't say all the same, but very similar. Yeah. <laughs> and I would also say that as an engineer, there's like an inherent problem solving knack that folks like. Right. There's a reason folks tend towards engineering. Mm -hmm. And something that excites me is more hey, you come to me with a problem, I wanna figure out a good way to solve this. I may not be the best person to tell you to do it in Python versus Node versus whatever, but on the approach side of, hey, what's the best way to solve this particular problem, figure out a nice scalable or solution based on the context, there's a lot of context, but I feel like that's something that engineers like don't really ever lose or get bad at because you like the problem solving yeah. aspect of it. You asked me like earlier like what the difference between a smaller company and a, a larger company. One thing that also doesn't change is exactly what you're talking about. Um, uh, it doesn't matter much if it's like technology A, B uh, or C, but the aspect of uh, collaborating, uh, avoid working silos, like in a smaller startup, you have to do everything, and yeah. then you have to make like quicker decisions yeah. many times, and and then you actually s you rush some steps to get the code out. Yeah. Where like in a larger, you have like a, a lot more of like checking and balances on the way. Hundred percent. And the extremes are where the mistakes happen and the the the, the biggest challenge, like finding the balance as everything else in life, finding the balance of not too much process and like not too little process yeah. and that's where like the smaller to the bigger you can have like a smaller organization and be very bureaucratic and not moving stuff yeah and you may have like a, a larger organization that go fast so it's not but it tends to have like a lot more check and balances one and another but yeah the engineering part of it it's you know it's it's not much about like the technology a or b or c it's like yeah. how you collaborate to make sure that quality code yeah. gets to the customer hands but adding the value that will move the business forward 100 so, 100 yeah earlier you mentioned culture establishing culture can you quickly define for folks listening what do you consider engineering culture and then what's sort of your go-to way of establishing the right culture and what, what that is for you? We hear a lot like, oh, we don't have a good culture, we want to create a good culture. We're like, yeah. But what is culture? Yeah. I will just share my, my own uh, definition. Culture is like when it gets 
Sunday night and you think about the next day and you're excited about that. When you wake up, I want to actually be with those people. I want to work with them. I, I I'm actually have this challenge that I'm excited to, to, to put behind me. So a culture is a place where you want to go because you feel part of it. And what is the opposite of it? Oh my goodness, tomorrow is Monday, can't believe. So that's You're a, dreading the like mo uh, Monday morning stand up, man. Yeah, like you don't enjoy the processes, you don't enjoy the people, you don't even know like, uh, you know, like you care less about the product, uh, no. So, so the culture is like a place where people are happy. Yeah. And, uh, and if you don't, and of course, and what, what does that need? What does the uh, business need from? Yeah, and then yeah, then you think like you know, people should feel like being home, yeah. like be treated with respect, with transparency. We all know where we go. We are together on the good days and also like uh, on, on the not good days, and and that's how we start building the culture. But to answer just your question about what the culture, in my opinion, it's a place where people want to be. They share a collective goal, nice. and they are united to actually achieve that goal together. Nice. I feel like one challenge is a lot of companies establish, okay, here's what we want to do. Here's what our culture is. Here's what, you know, the team's trying to do. How do you ensure that someone joining the team fits into that, first of all? And how do you ensure that the culture stays Po like stays the same or stays positive as the team is growing because as you add more people more parts more teams more moving pieces stuff changes uh, especially when you start going remote and you start doing distributed that's another variable where i've never worked with you but you know we're two cities apart but we have to like work like we've been working together for i don't know how long so how do you how do you think about that when scaling and growing a team yeah so after after pandemic people we start to think a lot more like you know um how, how does that actually impact my culture because we we used to go like to the offs every day we had like our routines and then one may say that it was easier to build a culture yeah in my opinion not necessarily okay um i've been building distributed teams for many many years way prior to the pandemic and I always invested on the human connections. Got it. We may not see every day together, but it's important that myself, my teams, my managers, uh, like everyone on the team get some time, quality time together throughout the year. It may be like a couple of days, a few days, like in a whole year together, yeah. but that is, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, and when you say distributed, just to clarify, you mean located in... Different times on different cities. That's different times yeah. on different cities, different countries, different yeah. continents. Yeah. Uh, but making the effort and the investment to put people together at least once a year, it, it's in my opinion, it, it pays it off uh, uh, any investment that you you may want to consider. So, um, and that may establish your culture. Yeah. You know, like hey, we do we we see like a couple of days a year, but when we do, we do like a. Uh, I work in a company that we would do like um, in January, third week or so of January, we would do like a week together. Um, and we would allow people only to travel uh, arriving on Monday and leaving on Friday. So we don't even ask for people to be actually taking time away from their families. Yeah. So on those small things, we start polishing the culture. Because if we like. say that, hey, we respect your own time, Yeah. So we will allow like business hours for you to travel. Yeah, sounds like a very small thing to do, right? But that starts to define the identity of the, co the the company, the culture of the team. You're sending like a message that's super important: the human connections. I'm making you a big ask, but not actually leave your family behind on a Sunday, as an example, to be there on Monday. So, it's possible. I think uh, building the 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 the, the, the culture remotely can be more challenging but if you're like if you think about and uh, you just go back to the basics of like uh, humanizing the environment i think you can nail nail it nice do you think culture is a top down notion or is it a bottom up 
or a little bit of both? I think it's a little bit of both. Like, because it's not only for the company to do the culture, it's also for like, it's everyone's. That's where like the company values comes in. Yeah. And then if you have people that live and breathe that, the result of that interaction, that dynamic environment, is what's gonna define the culture. Um, I work for a company that uh, had the, the, the company values, and um, one of the company values was about like collaboration. Um, and uh, interesting enough, one of like the co-founders of the company would completely ignore that, would just do things in style because he was the co-founder, he had like a, the technical knowledge, he would just actually go and ignore all the process and push code through. I started having issues with it. I said like, well, we have to, you know, like it's part of our core values to actually collaborate with each other. If you actually just again, oh, but uh, it's faster. Faster is not necessarily better, hundred percent, right? And then there's that saying that uh, if you want to go faster, you go alone. If you want to go further, we go together. Yeah, I actually said that many times, um, and because that is the opposite of actually building a good culture, because the rule must apply to everyone. And um, uh, but we are talking about like the building the culture. You can also like mess up with the culture if we don't if we don't follow like the company values uh, from you know and uh, on your day to day. Makes sense. You mentioned investing in you know human face to face for mm -hmm. getting a distributed team. What what's your go to? So like I've done a bunch of offsites with the companies I've worked at. Offsites generally tend to be a mix of like, hey, there's going to be like a big planning session. I feel like half the team is phased out during the planning sessions because they're either not involved or it's not engaged enough and then half of it is partying but what what do you think is a really good investment of time and resources when you bring the team together how do you foster that connection and the reason i ask is i was at indeed for a while and we were in person and then we went remote and i feel like the only reason i was able to work well with the team remote was i knew the team i knew how they worked i knew how they operated I knew who I could ping on Slack. I knew who was a, hey, don't trouble me during the day kind of person. There were some people who were like, hey, put a meeting on my calendar if you want to talk. And so understanding how folks worked allowed me to better work with that team. But when you're only meeting for a week, a year, how do you make the best of that situation? Yeah, well, well I agree. I guess we agree that it has to be. It has to have some structure. Yeah. You cannot just put people there and expect. Uh, you know. Yeah. What am I doing here? You know. But I, I think like the most. Um, uh, the the one thing that I tried, if at the end of that week we all look back, was it worth or not that time together? Uh, and you're absolutely right. If you actually you were in the office and then you went distributed, you knew, you know people already. Yeah. So it, it is easier. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. <clears throat> so if you have like a completely distributed team, uh, my previous company, uh, we didn't even have an office. We have like a PO box. Like this company now at Hireview, we do have an office at the headquarters in South Lake, but everyone is distributed. So my point is for that week, if I have to do something like that, is like I would try to do everything that we cannot do while we are remote. Example, can we do plenty sessions remote? Yes, we can. Yeah. So that is less prior than other activities. So there are like many team building activities. Um, one of my favorites is, is like you you do like some trivia games about the people itself. Nice, I like that. So, you know, like, what do you like, what do you don't like, places that you've been, yeah, crazy things that maybe you consider that you have done in your life that maybe people don't know. And then you start just doing like, kind of like a gamification of like, you know, uh, things about yourselves, think about them themselves that 
after they leave that exercise could take, you know, two, three hours, half a day, an entire day with activities like that. At the end of like that first day, for instance, they would look back. I didn't know that you actually are passionate about soccer. Yeah. Yeah, I play that. Oh, you play that out like, you know, in different countries, whatever. And then now they are talking about something that goes way yeah. beyond work. Yeah. Guess. And it also fosters the relationship after, right? So if you find a commonality, you'll now make a Slack channel. You start pinging each other. Hey, did you do that? Did you watch that? Right? Yes. So it, it and that could have that. so many, that, that human connection. Uh, if you have people only talk about work all the time, on the long run, uh, you're actually missing the opportunity to 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 solve challenges or um, you know uh, like we'll just make like the work conversation a lot easier. People will get agreements easier because they're gonna correlate with other things, and uh, uh, it, it literally removes so many barriers. So I think I'm not saying that if you're gonna go for like an uh, an offsite, you cannot do planning. planning. But don't start with like the plan. Don't start with the prioritization like day one. Allow the time for people to connect. Uh, have you heard about like the concept of unconference? It's the idea of like not having a bring people together, but not for an agenda, y right? Yeah, you do have exactly. You do have uh, topics like AI and. Uh, could be one. Um, scalability of our applications can be another one. Like how could we innovate for our customers could be another one. And then during like a, a second day could be like an unconference where you have those topics and in, then you get, get like people from sales. I've been he hearing a lot about like this. How can we actually innovate in our product? And that's where like the ideas and uh, the alignment comes throughout the team. Yeah. So there's like many, many different uh, well, approach. techniques, approach. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, that will help uh, make that week a little bit more uh, structured and productive. Nice. Again, this is more just a selfish question for me to learn. But um, <laughs> when you come into a large established company as a new CTO, what does your first couple of weeks look like? Like, are you getting a lay of the land? Are you coming in, switching things up? Like, when you come into an already established setting, culture, process, environment, come, like there's already things in motion. So as a new CTO... What does what does your initial couple of days look like? What are you tackling? How are you fitting in? That's very fresh in my mind. This is gonna be uh, starting tomorrow, my week number six on this new job as CTO at Hireview, and I can tell exactly what I did. Um, uh, well, when you start like in a job like this of this level of maturity and growth, your first day is not actually your first day. You have to start before than that. So uh, several weeks before my first day, um, I start talking with the CEO. I start getting like an understanding how the, uh, the teams are organized, names, pictures. It's literally putting on the table and trying to map what's going on. This is way before your first day. Uh, preparation is key. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when the first day came, I already had a couple of stakeholders, a few stakeholders flying to Salt Lake City. Uh, I arrived at on Sunday, Monday morning, nine o'clock local time. Uh, I already had like my computer set up. 30 minutes into it, I had a meeting with the entire team. Everyone, people in Eastern Europe, people in Europe, Americas. I want to give a name and a face to everyone. I'm Alberto, I'm in the new CTO. Here's like my leadership style. And to start with, I love to be with everyone on the ground working together. So there's no right or wrong questions. I just want to create this relationship with yeah. you. 
ask me. And so I talked for five minutes and I gave 55 minutes for people to ask questions so they know me better. So that's how I started. Nice. 30 minutes into the... And Were then, those questions by the employees more personal, more professional? I'm just curious what mix. someone asks you. Uh, people ask like what I like to eat. Nice. And I said, I'm a steak lover, nice. <laughs> but I eat everything, no allergies. So uh, to, you know, uh, sharing a little bit of the challenge that they are facing. And how do, Albert, how do you think about like the, the, the way that we are organized as a team? Like, and I was very honest. And I said, like, I think we, we, we have an opportunity here to be making a few moves and organize the team instead of like the, the formation be uh, four, three, three kind of stuff. Like we're going to do like, you know, like more in the midfield, like a little less in attack and then we're going to win. So as any other sport, you have formations and I actually like, and why? And people, wow, that makes sense. At the end of that hour, um, I had so many questions. My Slack just didn't stop. Like I got like dozens of questions after that. At the end of that first day, it was a really long day. I made sure that I actually replied to every single message. Yeah. And it doesn't matter which position you have in the team. Every position is important. 100%. And then acting accordingly and giving the time that people deserve, you are actually what? Building the culture. Wow, this leader... It's with us. It's answering my questions like directly. It's I, approachable. It's reachable. It's not like seven levels up and yeah. And then every every day, I would take as much as time. It's it's being exhausting. It's like really long days. But that's what leaders do, until they have like things working well. Yeah. Um. So week three, I made a, like an org change. Nice. The people that would get affected. What is the easiest thing to do? Layoffs. If you're doing like an org chart, there's people that don't fit, you let people go. That's what companies do. I talk with every single person that would be affected because those roles would be different. Guess what? Really great people. It's just that the position, the titles are like off, like the job descriptions are not aligned with what people are doing. So I took the time individually one by one and no one was let go. It was just positioning them in the right place. Uh, and I, I feel proud. I go when I, you know, I go to bed and put my head on the pillow. I, I, I feel really good about that. Uh, so that intimacy of knowing what people do, understanding where the boat is going and trying to position them better, then these people, they talk. And I say, wow, you know, I like it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and lead by example is actually doing, remember we talk about like being hands-on? Yeah. I'm hands-on on like okay. implementing writing stuff, like everything that I say before I even propose a change. All the definitions and like with colorful diagrams and showing like this is what's going to make us successful. So yeah. starting a new job as a CTO of like a large organization, it is indeed a mix of understanding what's out there and be confident that the change that you're gonna make is gonna be better for for everyone. And you, you're, nothing is written set in stone. And I say like, uh, whatever brought us up to this point, I guarantee you is not gonna take, take us to the next level. So we need to change. If you are not okay to change, then come to talk with me. We can see what we can do. But. Maybe it's not the right place, yeah, or maybe right. you're not in the right place uh, uh, on, the, on the right team. Uh, right team, but um, that's a little bit about yeah. what what is this to start like in a in a company as a CTO. And how do you juggle? So you have goals, expectations. Other leaders are like, "Hey, you're coming in. We need this delivered, that delivered." So how do you juggle the? Hey, we gotta deliver, push stuff, but also make these like core changes at the mm. same time. And how how do you balance it? Or do you say, hey, let's have, you know, lower KPIs or smaller goals while you're making the changes? Or is it still like, is there a right balance there? Of um, one of the 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 persons on the team asked me the question: Is the organization? Uh, okay with the is, is slowing down 
because we're gonna have to make all these changes. We're gonna have to replace the the turbines while we're flying. Yeah. Are we okay to actually just move it slower? Here's what very 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 similar same question. similar question and. Um, we will not go slower. That's the, that's the point. Organizing ourselves will make us better. Yeah. Let me give you like one example. It's happening right now. So we have, we just started Q2. We have like a bunch of initiatives that we want to start in Q2. I'm still learning about the initiatives, but I ask like, what are the initiatives that everyone in product engineering are doing? Not easy to find out. We have four different ticket systems there's people doing, there's like initiatives that engineering is doing that product doesn't know. There's initiative that product is actually planning for like this group of people to but do, they but they are busy doing other critical. Uh, the, so there's technical strategic work and there's feature strategic work. Yeah. I said, we don't have a single source of truth for the roadmap. Like what's the basic of Kanban? Limit work in progress. For like the team, um, the ideal number of concurrent uh, number in it, of initiative, number of initiatives, it's 18. We could have actually worked in 18 initiatives at the same time. Only for the engineers, we are actually 47. Wait a minute, Albert. 18 to 47? Said yes, we are doing a lot more than what the team can actually handle in a how do you came up with that number? I have like in my methodology, I talk this yeah. about in my book as well, like the team formation, how teams should be organized. I call delivery teams, not agile team, not sprint team, delivery teams. Why? Because they must deliver it. They must be connected with the company goals. But just by doing 40 plus initiatives when your capacity is like 18, what does that tell us? We are doing a little bit of everything, yeah. but not actually completing things. Yeah. And that is slowing us and down. And probably cutting corners to get stuff over the line. Absolutely. And then the shortcuts and like the band-aids that you have to put all over the place is, is not pretty. Yeah. So that's not beneficial for the company, not beneficial for individuals or as, as a team. Because people get burned out. Everyone is super busy. It's dysfunctional. It's literally, it is dysfunctional. Yeah. And I'm not including initiatives from our InfoSec group that you can put like another 15. And for our cloud operations, which is, uh, they had like about like 20 initiatives. So if you sum 40 plus, plus 20, plus 15, and your max is 18, it's, and then like you have security pulling one perspective, then you have engineers pulling from another perspective. Then you have product pulling from another perspective. But it's the same group of people working. So now going back to the original question, if, it, if how do we deal? Like, well, first thing is like make the invisible work visible. 100%. Just put all the cards on the table. Organize all that work. And then now we are start doing like some sort of now we can talk about it. Let's let's prioritize. Do we really need to upgrade this framework now? Oh, it's end of life, uh, December of this year. It's a, it's a t-shirt size is a small. Maybe we don't need to do that in Q2. We can do that like in Q3 and that would be fine. So we don't need to do yeah. that right now. So uh, uh, in this uh, past weeks, I got like, Alberto, as we are organizing these delivery teams, are you okay to have like uh, one person working on one initiative? I said, by definition, a, a, a team of one is not a team. Yeah. No, you can't. Why you can't? Because how are you going to be doing the reviews? Oh, somebody else can do it. But now it's an interrupt of someone that has no context. Like, so and then the reviews also lower quality because... It's lower just, quality. Like, and then like the code itself, like, you know, has become, become like a, a much larger change at once. So like there's so many things that can go wrong. So establishing the definitions from the get-go, what is the team, what's the team formation, what's the number of initiatives that you... And then you can actually start measuring like... Uh, you know, like uh, how long does it take from point A to point B? You can do like, a, but first things, and this is not like reinventing the wheel. This is limit work in progress. And um, so um, 
I think that's like a, like one of like the, the the area of focus that smaller organization or larger organizations struggle. It's limited the, 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 the work in progress and having focus. Like context switch, it's very expensive for any human who regards who you are, where you came from. Yeah. So how can you actually consent how, how can you create an environment for your teams to have focus? That's what's gonna move uh, the organization faster. I like how passionately you talk about this stuff because I feel like you've <laughs> both faced it in various capacities, plus you enjoy the process of like I feel like at the end of it, if you look at it, it's like a well-oiled machine. Like I feel like I use you that term a lot. Yeah, yeah. very yeah. oiled machine. Yeah, I like that. One thing I wanted to just get your opinion on is what's your take on engineering and product being under the same leadership or different leadership? Because I know a lot of companies work very differently. Like. Sometimes both PMs and engineers report to the same person. Sometimes they're very different orgs and they act as stakeholders for each other. Do you have a preference? Do you have an opinion on what makes the most effective team in this situation? Um, if I have a preference, yes, I do. And I also have an opinion. <laughs> uh, I think it, it depends on the stage of okay. the company. Okay. If you're like in the early days, uh, I think I've seen successful product engineering being one or yeah, being being one person leading like product engineering. Yeah. Uh, when I joined Schoology, uh, we did have like my predecessor was uh, one person doing both, and he was able to do like a very good job from point A to point B. But as the company grows. I find that it's really hard to have that one person because it's going to like product management. It, it is a discipline that it requires. It's a full time job and it's not easy. Yeah. Same as an engineering leader. If you have one and maybe you are actually missing the opportunity to do more in-depth aspects of each of one of these disciplines. If you talk about product management, you have you have product management, you need to understand the market, like what's your tangible address market. You need yeah. to understand your customers. You need to, you have design, product design is under product. You have uh, research, you have, um, you, you, you have to uh, run surveys, you test, you, you test, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff and then there's project management, which is a characteristic in my teams. It's not only from product, but engineering I also have to do project manager. I, in my teams, I don't have uh, scrum masters and yeah. uh, project managers in general. I think teams need to Needs be it. able to self-report and self-organize. But in an engineering side, as an engineering leader, like how the the process like to do like to to build a very oiled machine requires a lot of energy you talk about my passion that's how i lead that's who i am so yeah. people feel the energy if you don't have like uh that energy you know um you cannot ask for people to have that yeah so now if you're like the same leader doing how are you gonna be doing that it becomes really unless you're very hands-off which at that point is a choice for the company as well. It's a choice for the, maybe okay. the stage in the moment. But in getting like a product and an engineer to be on the same page, it's a hard job for a CEO to find. 100%. Because if you have like a product person and an engineer person that's the opposite, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be... Hiding a lot. They're going to be working silos. Yeah. silos. And now you have an engineer roadmap and a product roadmap. And then eventually you're going to realize that that's just not, yeah. we're going to go full circle on the conversation that we just had before. Yeah. So I think um, from from my experience, the preference would always have like someone that is good in product and someone that is good at engineering and having your head of product in engineering being just separate human beings. The reason I ask is I also feel like Eventually, being able to find effective engineering leaders and product leaders 
is a slightly different skill set. Absolutely. So if you're one person who's leading both, you're going to look for mixed qualities in everyone. Absolutely. And maybe that's not the best for that discipline, right? Um, but no, I 100% agree. Yeah. Um, I 100% agree. Uh, I think pro- product as, it's, as a discipline on its own, people think, hey, you should be more technical. Not Like there's so many opinions on how to run a product org. But if the same person, it's going to, I'm assuming it's going to be a very technically driven product org because the person making the decisions is looking for those skill sets and it's going to affect how you build the org. You're absolutely right. If the person has a little bit more of like a product driven experience and mindset, then engineering is going to be lacking yeah, yeah. some of like the and it, it vice versa if it's someone that is like a little bit more technical now you're going to be missing the opportunities of like you know uh that product uh could actually uh, help the organization to grow so one way and another is like you're going to be m- not as effective as you could so uh, if i had to recommend for uh, anything to founders if they're debating that is you know um is to have two people, but then of course there's always the budget, yeah. there's always, but is if it's a SaaS software, you have to invest on product engineering. 100%. It's, uh, you know, that's not where you wanna save. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of early stage folks, they start out as the CEO being both the CEO and the CPO. Correct. And then they'll get a tech person or a tech co-founder who's mm-hmm. like driving implementation and then they figure product out. And at some point they're like, hey, I need a product person. But sometimes the CEO is like, no, I know this product too well. I want to be the product person. And again, you're splitting responsibilities between being a good CEO and a good CPO. And you always sway one side or the other. And here's like, I was was giving like a a consulting to a company a few few months back. That's exactly what happened. Like the, the CEO and founder was performing the role of CPO. And so like, we need a product person. So there's this concept that I wrote in my book that's called like the iron triangle, which is when you have product, engineering and design working united, like in a day to day to build the solution. Product will always have the product perspective, you know, go to market and the next shiny feature out of the yeah. door. Engineering is going to, oh, we need to refactor. We need to actually uh, upgrade yeah. this framework and design. So we have to think about the different screen size, accessibility. That's the law. So that tension is important, but that's yeah. the iron triangle. It's strong and doesn't break. And it's important to have the tension. But now when you have the CEO playing that side of the triangle, what happens is like we're missing the opportunity to be meeting new customers, to understand the vision, like to actually revalidate the other areas on the organization, sales, marketing. And um, and then companies struggle. So like make the investment of bringing like a product person. And we did. We did. Now we have two sides of the triangle. We have product, we have engineering. I, I helped adding these two people in that company. And now it's, it's missing the design. Like we have like engineers and like the product actually doing, it's just- Wireframing and- Yeah, and it's not like when people think about the design, they think, oh, like design how like the, the button was gonna be on the screen. I said, no, 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 it's about the, it's about the it's, customer yeah. journey. Yeah, 100%. Is, is, that's the experience, you know, but so the minimum of like a delivery team, it has to have like the iron triangle and then you can have, you know, maybe you don't need QA, maybe you don't need like some specialties. Uh, early on, but the the, the, the the CEO is splitting roles on building the product, maybe in the early stage, but uh, it's a good investment as well for the CEO, do CEO job yeah. and allow product engineering to actually build the product. 100%. Uh, and just quick side note on the design comment you made. I was working with a designer at Indeed and I was just like, hey, why are you putting this here? Why are you putting that there? Just to understand. And she was like, there's a lot of studies on what screen size is, where are people looking, what are I like, there's a lot of science behind how to make a button pop, how to incentivize a certain action, how to choose colors, where to place the button to incentivize the most click through rate. So they're going through the funnel. And before that, I was like, oh, yeah, you just 
put it where it looks nice, right? But there's a lot of thought that goes into putting the right elements in the right place so you're highlighting the right things, Absolutely. making the right things on the page pop, making the right um, actions on the right. And I didn't know until that conversation that there was all this that goes behind making a good design. And I feel like a lot of people, especially early on, you're like, yeah, let's just put something together because you're worried more about revenue, product market fit. But at some point, you have to graduate to, a, hey, we need a design philosophy and we need someone to think about who's using this so we build the right product. It's, uh, engineers can get very expensive. Yeah. It's a lot cheaper to come up with the concept and the flow and validate that Using prototypes. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper than actually go implement and then realize, yeah, this is not working. So <laughs> yeah, been there. It's uh, it's uh, it, it makes sense, but people, it's it, it's 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 um, um, you know, companies just they they keep rolling, doing and doing, and then we need to do faster, faster, and faster. So you know, with time, I learned like just zoom out, see where you're going, like because if 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 you don't zoom out you're putting like a lot of energy to to propeller the boat to 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 a direction that's not where you want to yeah. be yeah and having a designer like the formation of the iron triangle sooner rather than later will help you i guarantee 100%, 100%. <laughs> also there's an analogy right like if you if you veer off 1 degree in the wrong direction too early down the line that's so far off whatever your original path was mm -hmm. that you just don't even realize you get down this you just I mean, you know tech debt after tech debt bad design after bad design you just keep going down that flow and you never have the option to reset because there's too much on stake yeah and um what you just said it, it, building software is it's it, it gets challenging because it's an abstract stuff yeah. so you if you, you're absolutely right if you if you correct the sooner you correct the the cheaper it will be yeah um if you you know i love like uh, going to regattas and all that kind of stuff it's the same thing you're racing the only source of power is wind and each boat can take their own route everyone on the team or on the boat is empowered to actually you know they have their contributions but a mistake early on you can fix that if you go like a, an hour, two hours, three hours in a race, Too far off. you're way, but like several minutes, hours behind in the context yeah, of, yeah, uh, and um, right. I think like software is the same thing. So many times uh, we, we companies tend to leave like the technical debt for later, but guess what? You're going to have to upgrade those frameworks. You don't need to be like on the on the alpha beta version you, like just like the regular GA yeah. if you don't keep catching up with that the cost is going to be and there's too many breaking changes down the line that now it's not a one day fix anymore it's a one month fix across yeah. seven teams and you got to do so much and then and then why is it, like, you, the, the the one thing that I I, I always tell it, it's guaranteed you're going to have to pay the question is, how much interest are you willing to, to pay? I like that. Alex. And um, I don't like to pay interest. I don't know about you, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you wrote the book, Building and Managing High Performance Distributed Teams. Why, why did you decide to first author a book? And then what is it about building high performance distributed teams that you think people miss very often that you're trying to capture in the book. Yeah. So I wrote this book during the pandemic. Um, at that time, uh, so we got acquired by Vista Private Equity. This is the sixth large private equity at the yeah. time yeah. Uh, in the world. They have their playbook. So they acquired us. And that was takes given time. 2020 Thanksgiving? Uh, yeah, like, uh, no, that was 2019, because then 2020, that's when yeah, the pandemic yeah, came, right? Yeah, yeah. So in February, so November to 
February, March when the pandemic, you know, like all the airports start to close yeah. and all that kind of stuff. From that time, that those couple of months were like very challenging. So I got like a spreadsheet with names that I have to lay off. Criteria. They are remote. I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? I cannot fire these people. I mean, this is like, this is like my chief architect, my head of QA, like, and by the way, we are like a distributed teams. Like, how can I actually have like, uh, like, no, we have to find synergies. I understand as you actually acquire companies, you have to find synergies where like, you know, uh, you don't need uh, a certain roles and all that kind of stuff. I started getting so um, I was very passionate and very proud. It was at the time the best team that I ever built. Like yeah. we got like to the point that we've been acquired and all those things are great. But the decisions, the top down decisions, just for the sake of actually running the playbook, it really, really hit my my heart. That's why I have my saints in one team, one heart. I said like, I brought this team up here and I will be the first to fight and die if it's necessary. Yeah. yeah. But I will not, I can bend, but I will not break. Yeah. And I was so frustrated at times, so angry at the times, because I knew that the decision was wrong. Yeah. And I fought so hard for it. But I also, I had to put that energy somewhere. Many leaders, remember that I talked like about uh, one leader that he was a product yeah, engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He calls me on like in February of that year when the pandemic was starting. And, like, and people were trying to figure out how do you actually build a team that is not in the ops? So I got like a, another friend is a professor of NYU. He calls me. These people are calling me to ask my advice on how to make a team that is not in the centralized office to work. Yeah. I said, people are calling me, like people that I admire, that are very successful, are calling me. And then I'm actually on the mix of that challenge, that frustration of taking like the playbook. I said, oh my goodness, you know what? And then they would say like, Robert, you should write a book. I said, <laughs> come on. I can even barely finish a sentence in English if that's, <laughs> that works. <laughs> At the end of that week on a Saturday morning, I remember as it was yesterday, I woke up like I couldn't sleep that well when I, I woke up like five in the morning or so, I opened Google Docs and I started to put a structure on what that would look like. Nice. That's when I start actually uh, writing the book from beginning to end. It took me six months to write. I really opened like my, my mind and my heart and I dumped everything there. Uh, talk with friends for reviewing and, and I had like so much passion and so much energy. But because of the pandemic came, that team that was supposed to be, many people that were supposed to be laid off, we had to scale 800% during the pandemic. If we, if we actually have made the decisions that the to follow the playbook, we would have failed. Yeah. We would have failed. Um, there was many, many cases where looking at the, the data and the metrics, I knew that on Monday morning, the application would crash. We would, have, we would be downtime. We would not be able to handle. Friday, 4 p.m., I call a meeting with the entire product engineering team and say, listen, we brought this company up here. There's a lot of kids going home schooling and they need Schoology. They need, if we do nothing, we will crash. And I'm not asking you to work in the weekends, but if you wanna help me to actually get this application up and running, we will have to make change. So all I'm asking is like, any volunteers? And I'm telling you the facts. Man, that weekend, I actually can feel the bumps. Every single person showed up and we work like what was necessary to make that happen. Nice. That is the culture. When people f feel they belong, when people were part of it. And yeah. that is 
gave me so much energy and that's when I pushed the book to uh, to be published. I never did that before. I'd even uh, like, I even like it was a book written with like technical knowledge. But it was also during a moment of my life that I had to put that somewhere. And that, of course, makes me really proud and um, aspects that uh, that I, I try to bring. That human connection, that that feeling that people fighting because they believe it and they care about yeah. the product. That is an aspect of like the distributed team that uh, is really, really challenged to have. 100%. And I feel like it's very, you know, with the amount of layoffs happening in the last year and a half. Oof. A lot of employees are now distancing themselves from the idea of really being tied to the vision. It's, a, I think, a lot harder now to get someone to be so bought in. And I feel like that's so leader specific. It, I think it doesn't matter as much about what the company is or what the product is. It's about the leader who's building the team that really has to fight to get everyone on the same page. Because a lot of people now are like, if if stuff doesn't work out, you're just going to lay me off. So why should I go all in? Why should I put in the extra effort? Why should I be so motivated about this if the company doesn't feel the same way? And I feel like that's a very leadership-driven sentiment that has to be given to the team, the employees, and everyone. Yeah, I, I saw one post another day on LinkedIn that said, uh, companies, stop saying that we are family yeah so well i understand the sentiment uh, a company must be a sustainable business yeah companies many times have to do hard decisions a business is made of like hard decisions if you're not having like hard decisions um you're probably missing uh, something but it, it is a relationship as any other when you get a job, it's, 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 it's like it's, as any other relationship. You, ha you have to put energy into that relationship. If you don't water the plant, it will die. If you don't water your friendship relationship, it will die. It will just go away. Yeah. So it will fizzle out, yeah. It's the same thing. So if you are like, we spend a lot of our time in life working. You must love what you do. 100%. If you really don't, I actually, I tell people, I help you to find a new job. I will help you. But don't waste your time just being in a place for, I always will pick challenge over comfort. And, and that's my recommendation to people because life at the end of the day is too short yeah. uh, for not being there. And now, yes, it, it's up to the leaders. But you're not required to stay there. 100%. If you don't align with the leaders, if you don't agree, the, the worst thing you can do is to complain. Yeah. Just you're putting energy to nothing. 100%. Either you drive the change or you accept it. Yeah. So I, I was watching something the other day where someone said, folks are really protective of their money. They'll put in a safe, put in a bank, protect it. But they don't protect their time. And they'll spend their time on anything and everything and they're w waste their time here and there not understanding that you don't get more of it like there's a very limited amount of time that you have whatever it be right so like you're saying how do you spend it on the things that matter how do you be more intentional about your job your work your family how do you just do the things you want to do and not just while away doing a job that you're like checked out of yeah some people take a some people realize that a little later in life um some people realize that a, a lot earlier in life some people never realize yeah <laughs> you know they're just there doing because it's comfortable yeah um and many times it's not the leader or the company challenge it's it's you Right, you expect to to get everything from the company, but how much are you giving? How much are you actually contributing? How much feedback are you giving to make that better? When you are complaining about something not working, what alternatives are you bringing to the table to fix it? What are you doing for 
to fix. And I tell, like, when people come bringing me, like, challenge, give me at least two, three options. Because just bringing me problems, yeah, sure, that's easy. <laughs> but can you do that? Yeah. That is, again, going back to our, like, that's building the culture. 100%. And that is empowerment. I'm actually willing to listen to, uh, to the ideas and how we can do this better. We can change anything. We can change. But don't expect me like to know all the answers. I'm a human as well. 100%. <laughs> you know? I was um, working at a startup where product leader would come and be like, hey, let's not do this. Or this is not the right thing. Or we had the liberty to figure out what tests we want to run, what features we want to build. They'd come and say, nah, I don't, like, I'm, I'm summarizing. But they'd be like, hey, I don't think that's the right thing to do. And my response would be like, hey, you keep shooting down ideas week after week, which is fine. I'm not saying keep my ideas. But if you shoot down every idea the team's coming up with, at least give me one or two directions to go on. Because obviously we're thinking on a very different line than you are, which is, again, fine. But if you're not liking the direction, at least tell me, hey, I'm thinking more along this line or this line or this line. So we can then work towards that. But if you just keep shooting down the ideas, eventually I run out of ideas. No one moves anywhere. We've spent weeks trying to figure stuff out. And if they're like 100% agree with what you're saying, if you have a problem with something, come with options and not just, hey, that's wrong. Because yeah. I don't think that helps anyone. Yeah. And um, when you keep like uh, having those discussions and just you can't move like your product like you, you can actually move forward. That's why, like the analogy I make, like you're literally on the boat, like just going in circles. Yeah. And uh, when that happens, like there's a question that I always ask my teams: What is our goal? Like, what is our north star? Where are we going? We have several milestones. There's so many paths yeah. for us to achieve that goal. But let's zoom out. Let's understand what's our goal uh, for, for this conversation, for this quarter, for this year, for like the, the, where, is, where, where we are taking the, the, the company. And just by asking that simple question, <laughs> what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to get from here that will allow us to achieve this goal? People say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, they, that, that conversation uh, even becomes ir irrelevant at, 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 at many, quite often. Yeah. So I think uh, always connecting the discussions to the goal. 100%. Everything that you do has to make you to get closer for that goal. Yeah. If and not, don't waste time. 100%. <laughs> Just like, 100%. Yeah. Um, nice. Uh, I like to end all conversations with a couple quick fire questions. What are three resources you'd recommend to folks who are early in their journey, building out teams, company startups? Do you have three resource recommendations? It could be books, podcasts, blogs, articles, whatever. Um, just three resource recommendations. Yeah, I'm not sure if I, I will have like the three on the top of my head, but uh, here's what I would, uh, that I always did and always uh, helped me. It's like, um, don't stay home. Find like a meetup uh, near you. Um, um, and uh, I go to like CTO, CTO events uh, or leadership events whenever I can. We just were talking like last week, I was in like a CTO craft yeah. in London and uh, I'm going to be in New York next week. Nice. So I, I love the face to face interactions. And um, I go to just different ones all the time. Nice. So um, now I'm going to start listening to your podcast. <laughs> but uh, other than that, is it's my recommendation. There's a couple of uh, uh, books that I can think that I really like. Uh, one is The Scale Up. Okay. Uh, um, another one that I've been, that I, I used, I changed it a lot, but it's called like The Who Book. Okay. Which is... The whole idea is to hire people based on who, who, who they, they are, are. Yeah. 
versus how they can show up in like in an interview. So there's a couple of books like that, but uh, of course my own book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we'll link everything and we'll. Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, th those are the ones nice. that. Um, Come to mind. Um, there's another one that is actually from a friend of mine. Uh, it's called like also Lean, Lean Inception. Okay. A really, really nice one. So Nice. What's your tech or startup stack? What do you use to run your orgs and run your teams? And when I say startup stack, I mean Jira, Atlassian, GitHub. Like, what's your full tool stack? Uh, everything that you said. Like, from my preference is uh, definitely like, a, you know, a, um, language i i don't have a preference preference i mean as a cto it's whatever i already worked with uh, php java uh, uh mainframe stack um, microsoft you name it but my preference is regardless of the languages um, uh, everything on the cloud nothing on premises um, it would be from from github gitlab um, as long as it's one, one, one of them, not yeah. all of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's my preferred stack. Yeah. It's not uh, five, four, three, any number more than one. Uh, that uh, two, two that, that do the same thing. Just pick one. Yeah, uh, and if you have two, converge that into one. Yeah. So, but it, yeah, between GitHub, uh, AWS, all the cloud, I, I I work with Azure as well. Try to avoid like multi cloud. Just pick one. But sometimes you can't. Yeah. Um, in those cases, it's and those okay. are exceptions. Though. Those are exceptions. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if you have a customer like Walmart, they don't want to be in AWS. Yeah. On those cases, yeah. Like, uh, but, um, and then for like documenting confluence, like all the Atlassian stack, I think it's it's great. Nice. People complain like, oh, Jira is it? like no, it's because you're not administrating Jira correctly. If 100%. you do that correctly, you're gonna be fine. And that's a full time job in itself. It, it is, it is. You have to put the workflows, the check and the balances. Yeah, 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 I'm actually yeah. doing this like in my new job now. And um, but that's my pref preferred stack. Nice. The the one thing I would say about tools is like less is more you you don't try to solve your problems you're like putting another two you yeah. don't need it yeah <laughs> you don't need it it yeah. becomes a nightmare so the less the better 100 percent. what would you say is your support system so you've been leading teams building so much writing a book what's your support system what allows you to be so successful and driven uh i think it's my endless energy <laughs> <laughs> I do have a lot of energy, uh, but it's about having focus. Yeah. If you look at my career, it's always being like a step up. C consistency is key. And um, I think like one of my strengths is I don't give up. Like my previous job, I it was one of like my challenge the most challenging ones and i left when i left um the company was profitable the team is a very very oiled machine to the point that i actually can step out and there's no difference. there's no difference so to get to that point many 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 times i thought giving up so my support is like if I say I will do something, I will do it. Nice. Uh, even, even though uh, many times it's, uh, I'm struggling. But every time you struggle, every challenge you have, once you actually overcome that, you look back, the feeling of achievement is so good. Yeah. So that's my support system is yeah. like... Uh, um, you like getting over the hill, but the journey to get up. Oh, there. that is fabulous. Like yeah. The feeling that we have. Yeah. And many times, you know, nothing is easy because... Yeah. And if it's easy, we will not have like yeah. that same f a feeling of achievement. Um, part of the reason I started this podcast is I feel like entrepreneurs are always looking for the quick win, the quick exit, the quick payday. And they don't, they're not ready for the five, 10 year journey that it's going to take to build a successful, yeah. profitable company. A lot of people are like, oh, do this and do this. And then, you know, sell in two years. I'm like, that's very unrealistic. And if that's what you want to do, just go get a tech job. Don't like do entrepreneurship for a payday. Don't do it for an outcome. Do it for 
the journey because the journey is what you're going to be doing most of the time. And you have to enjoy the journey because it, it's a long one. 100%. It's a long one. So um, if you're not enjoying the journey, uh, you yeah, it, it's, it's rough. Yeah. Even, even when things go wrong, you have to be okay yeah. with it. Know that's part of it. Learn yeah. from it. Yeah. And that's what's going to make you successful. Yeah. So that's my, I, 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 I agree with you. I like ending every conversation with the last question. So I'll ask you one for a future guest. I asked my previous guest for a question, and your question is, if you had to do something non-technical outside of your professional job or capacity, what would you do and why? Um, my, my passion is, is to be on the water. Um, I love j just everything about it. And uh, if you look at the, the cover of my book, it's like boats. Okay. So for me, being on the water, um, if, I, if I wasn't doing anything on tech, I would be something uh, with uh, building teams on the water, like okay. uh, organizing events, uh, regattas, or nice. like uh, any, anything around that. Nice. Uh, that's probably what I would, I still probably gonna do that after, uh, you know, once my, my daughter is, uh, like self-sufficient, yeah. probably that's one of the things that I'm gonna be doing. And nice. uh, I can't, re I can't think of idea of retiring. So I think my retirement is gonna be doing the same in on a different water. field, yeah. on the water. Yes. Makes sense. Yeah. What's your question for a future guest? Um, the question. Let me think about here. Um, I guess. It can be anything. There doesn't have to be like tech or work related. Any question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just thinking like, if it, um, I, when I when I talk about like uh, resilience and persistency, and people ask me like, what made you to have like like this? C can you learn how to be persistent? Can you learn to not give up? If if yes, like what do you do? What 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 like when you're like in a very challenging situation? Okay. How can you learn to not give up and overcome that? Is <laughs> is there like a technique? Is there like a way of doing that? Or you are born with that? Or, or or is that defined in your childhood? Makes sense. It's a it's a tough like how do you persevere over? An obstacle, and what's your go-to path? In it? Yeah, because I think it's it's there's a lot to do with your childhood and where you came 100%. from. But I, can you learn and develop and, and learn? Uh, can you teach that? Uh, and Excellent. that uh, it's a tough one. I, like I, I don't know the answer, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't know who I have on next, but we'll ask them that. Yeah. But thank you for coming on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for having me. Where can um, listeners find you? What do you want to plug? And we'll link everything in the description. But Yeah, like the best way to reach out to me through LinkedIn. Yeah. And uh, I always try to reply to every single message, connect. And uh, and that's, uh, that's all. Yes. Thank you and very we'll much. Link, yeah, we'll link your book, link your website. And if someone reaches out, I'll send them a copy of your book. Beautiful. And please leave me a review on Amazon. Yeah. Every review counts. One review yeah. at a time. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming on.